Hello, David. Hello, Sandy. What are we talking about today? We are talking about emotions. I'm excited. Me too. I'm excited to talk about emotions. I love this topic. Um, so in your words, David Shen, what exactly is an emotion? Like what, what's your definition of emotion? Hmm. You know, when we started work on this podcast, I really hadn't thought much about the exact definition of emotion uh, and also the term feelings, which I thought maybe they're synonymous. They were the same thing. But when I dug into it more, I actually found there was a difference, uh, which I think I agree with. Um, so for me, emotions are primal and they're the same through every human. Scientists theorize they originate from the limbic system, which is the most primitive parts of our nervous system. Uh, and that determines our reactions to stimuli in the environment. So very much dealing with basic needs, uh, survival against the saber tooth tigers of whatever time we're, <laughs> we're living in at, at that moment. How would you define emotion, Sandy? Yeah, one of our lovely mentor coaches, um, she introduced us to a few people who research emotions. One person is Candace Pert, who wrote this book, Molecules of Emotion. It's pretty sciencey, it's pretty nerdy, but I highly recommend it. And there's a couple other books I'll mention later on in this episode. But Candace Pert discovered the opiate receptor, um, and she also studied emotions. And her theory, she states that emotions are chemicals, hmm. plain and simple. They're signals that help us link the body to the mind or the mind body. I think she calls it the body mind, actually. Hmm. And um, yeah, another person um, who I like, who our, our mentor coach introduced us to is Carla McLaren. I'll talk more about her later. And she offers that emotions are messengers and these messengers have important information for us. Um, so I, I think emotions are there to help us make decisions, to make choices and to allow us to move forward in our lives. And I would also offer <laughs> that there are no negative or positive emotions, and this will come up a bit in this episode. Again, our mentor coach believes this, as well as Carla McLaren. There are only emotions, period. And they're all there for a reason, and they have a purpose in our lives. Yeah, that last part about neutrality of emotions is pretty important. And yeah, definitely we'll get back, uh, get into that a bit later in this podcast. Yeah. Well, like right now, for example, <laughs> just to <laughs> yeah, drag do it now. Out. Well, like anger, anger can be negative. It's often seen as negative. Um, and in that regard, yeah, it can cause harm. Uh, if, if, if it's, if it's left to fester, you know, think about rage, the, the far end, the deep end of anger, anger can also be very positive. If you think about, um, an athlete, on a sports team who's really fired up or pissed off and this causes them to to elevate their efforts and they win the game so is that negative i don't think so i think that'd be a, if it's your team winning that might be a very positive thing and the same with happiness this can be a beautiful emotion it's usually thought of as such but when we are pushing away other uncomfortable or so-called negative emotions to always be happy this isn't good. This can be a negative thing and it can be very toxic. And unfortunately in our culture, toxic happiness, like toxic positivity, this is a thing and it can be very harmful. So emotions, they can go both ways. Hence the neutrality. There are no negative or positive emotions. So um, stepping off soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> What about feelings? You mentioned feelings earlier. Are these the same as emotions? Are they different? How would you define a feeling? So in my research in this in preparation for this podcast, I found a post from Better Up. It's one of those big uh, coaching companies out there um, helping corporations get uh, coaching in there. Uh, I found a great overview of feelings, uh, which I sh I'll share. So their first point was that Feelings are more specific than emotions. So emotion like sadness could be more specifically expressed as sadness due to loneliness, uh, despair or depression, for example. Feelings are a learned response to an emotional trigger. 
So everyone's response to emotions can be very individual and different. Sandy's previous example of anger being perceived positively or negatively is a great one uh, for this uh, aspect. Feelings are conscious ex experiences of sometimes unconscious emotions, uh, often because of trauma. So there could be a lot of emotions that are welling up uh, that are unconscious to us, uh, but they shape our conscious feelings uh, coming outward. And then your environment can influence your feelings. So things like culture, religion, uh, right, create judgments, uh, this notion of good or bad emotions, I should or shouldn't feel this way. Our parents often tell us kids that we should do this way, should be happy, should not be happy, blah, blah, blah. Those bullies in high school can really shape <laughs> a young adult's view of the world. I mean, think of our own experiences uh, back then, you know, all those things can can influence how we feel today. What do you think, Sandy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the um, I wrote wrote down very individual and different. Um, that that resonated with me. Like we all have these same chemical reactions, but how we feel them can be very subjective, very different. Um, and yeah, we share those emotions. And again, knowing what emotion you are having is important. Language is important. Um, going to talk about emotional vocabulary lists in a little bit, but a feeling is it's very subjective and it's very personal. Two people can have the emotion of anger. And again, you know, one can feel rejected, abandoned, helpless, and another can feel empowered, empowered enough to, you know, win at sports ball or whatever. <laughs> it can be a rush for that person. So same emotion, different feelings. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. Two people can have very different expressions of, of the same emotion. And then that leads to why they are feelings and not just emotions alone. Yeah. And then there are, there are what are, what are called faux feelings, F-A-U-X. So in our coach training, we, we studied nonviolent communication and there was talk of feelings versus faux feelings. So what do we mean when we talk about faux feelings? Yeah, faux feelings are words that seem like emotions or feelings, but are actually evaluations or judgments. So examples would be words like abandoned, abused, betrayed, blamed. When you start a sentence with, I feel you, dot, 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 or I feel like, <laughs> dot, 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 usually puts a person into a tenuous place with what comes next and whether it's fake or real. Yeah, and I have a trick for figuring out faux or real feelings and it's to put the two words by you at the end of a, a, a phrase a word a phrase a sentence and if it doesn't make sense it's a true feeling or emotion and if it makes sense that's a faux feeling so for example if you're feeling angry i feel angry by you makes no sense so that's a real that's a real feeling however if you think about um the faux feeling of being abandoned, I feel abandoned by you. That's a judgment, that's a perspective, that is a faux feeling. So there's sort of an internal, external thing going on here. And before we talk about emotions and coaching conversations, let's just, let's touch, just touch, <laughs> touch on the topic of coaching versus therapy when it comes to emotions. And one thing I hear new coaches ask all the time is, shouldn't emotions, emotions be left to the therapist? So what are your thoughts on this, on this therapy versus coaching when it comes to emotions? Wow. It's just, when I hear that, it just <laughs> it makes what? me laugh. What yeah. Well, it, I think it's totally false that coaches mm. never work with emotions and feelings. We work with emotions, feelings all the time. This is probably a better discussion for another time, this coaching versus therapy thing. But I think it has more to do with what the coach is comfortable with and uh, at that time, and also how they're trained than any set rules about emotions should be here or not, sh uh, shouldn't be here. Um, and there's certainly this fuzzy lines that are drawn between this, whether a client really needs a therapist for something or can be handled by coach. But I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to get into that right now, but 
we probably should have a podcast on that at some point. I'm, I, ha I have a list of future episodes. Now I'm going to put that on. I wrote that one down. Coaching versus therapy. And it might be a good discussion to have just for people listening, people curious about coaching. How is it different from therapy? So yeah, maybe we can have a future episode on that. Mm -hmm. um, our lovely mentor coach, I, I keep mentioning, she had this wonderful analogy that I use with new clients who have maybe experienced therapy but aren't um are new to coaching and and this mentor coach talked about emotions as being a pond and as a coach we walk around the pond we look at the pond we look at it from different perspectives we talk about the pond <laughs> we don't go in the pond because if we go in the pond we can drown and i don't know about you i don't swim actually i do swim but as you know <laughs> in this in this metaphor as a, as a coach i don't swim and uh and and diving deep into that pond that's that's therapy territory um but yeah i like that analogy and it, it usually resonates with new clients so let's talk about emotions in coaching conversations starting with how do you sense emotions in the client yeah the other day i heard a a wonderful way of talking about sensing emotions and feelings, which involves broadening our definition of language. So if we use the most obvious definition, we would say that we express emotions and feelings through our words, right? Those things that come out of our mouth. Uh, and this, the, this sounds are carried to our listeners' ears for interpretation. So if we broaden the definition of language to include other kinds of communication expression, then that opens us up to a much wider world of sensing emotions beyond just what's spoken out and what we hear. Um, and especially those that are not obviously expressed or, or even hidden uh, through that vocal language. What do you think of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first thing that came to mind as you were talking um, was somatic inquiry, like where, where in this body do you feel this? And I had a therapist who asked me that when I was working through grief and I, I can talk about anything. I'm very intelligent, very smart, <laughs> if I say so myself. But I can, I can be very logical and reasonable about things. And in one session, she asked me, where do you feel that grief in your body? And I had no idea. But it was, it was awareness, like, oh, we hold these things in our body. And that shows in a session sometimes, not always. Mm -hmm. um, and, and words are important. Words are super helpful at first to describe what we are feeling, especially when communicating to a loved one, a friend, if there's a conflict, words help the other person understand. Um, but they can also be so limiting, especially in a coaching conversation. And like I just said, many people live in their heads. I, I was living in my head, mostly. I mean, I still do, but I'm trying, <laughs> trying to bring the body into it, trying to bring the heart into it. Uh, but many of us live in our heads in this world of, of words, and sometimes words just can't describe emotions or feelings. And this is also why I love using metaphors and visuals in my coaching. Um, and I'm going to write down that episode. I think it's already on our list, but we need to have an episode about metaphors for sure. Yeah, that'll be a fun one. Yeah. Yeah, so in instead of words, like a client usually doesn't come out and say, I'm feeling sad or you know i'm very sad i mean maybe they will maybe that's a very aware client and lucky you <laughs> <laughs> but uh but i invite new coaches to watch for things like well body language number one um also nonverbals like sighs even clearing the throat coughing client i notice you just cleared your throat what does that mean it might bring something forward it might not but inquire, inquire about that. There could be an emotion lurking underneath that, um, whatever the client just did, that, that the client wasn't even aware of. And it's our job to create that awareness. Um, what else? Energy. Like, are they, I just sat taller. Are they slumping or sitting taller as they speak? Can't tell you how many times I've coached clients who are back in their chairs. I'm, I'm, for those listening, I'm sitting very low in my chair. My shoulders are kind of slumped. Um, there might be some grief or sadness there. And we're going to talk about grief later. It's a big emotion that comes up often in my sessions. 
what else eyes face i mean this is all body language um you know the watery eyes i notice there's some emotion coming up for you what's going on for you right now you know just inquire about that um other things tension around the mouth clenching the jaw what's what's that clenched jaw about you know and you don't have to be like super serious about emotions you can be playful emotions do not have to be serious humor is a great way to keep a client from going into the pool <laughs> as we talked about earlier or pond <laughs> or pond yeah to keep it light you know you, you honor the client and and whatever they're experiencing but bring them back to the present um but yeah stay out of that pool stay out of the pond as our as our mc our mentor coach often says yes all of that just wonderful ways of uh, determining the emotions um yeah facial expressions like a frown or smile all physical reactions and movements is there nervous tapping even skin color changes does the is the face turning white uh have you noticed that yeah it's kind of interesting when it happens i've never really seen that maybe i need a new monitor Um. (laughs) (laughs) maybe who knows yeah Uh, other nonverbal language yeah like waving their hands around when they talk or something like that like i do that uh, yep yeah uh and to add to the energy statement that you made you mentioned physical energy but there's also other types of energy that clients are putting forth um in session and uh these are things that come from you know concepts like energy work and intuition that you can really take hold of and when you read that in you may find something uh underneath the thing that you didn't realize Mm -hmm. so what can get in the way of being able to sense emotions and your clients, what do you think? Ooh, the list is long. Do it is long. <laughs> in this session, I don't know if we have to. <laughs> what time is it? Okay, go. Yeah, it's like, hmm, let's see here. Uh, yeah, uh, well, basic thing would be just like, what's triggering us as coaches? What are our fears that are inside? Things like fear of saying the wrong thing, fear of not being able to deal with a client that starts getting emotional. Uh, reactive, upset, crying, all that and more. Fear of going into an area that someone told me should be therapy. Uh, Fear of not being able to recover from an emotional deep dive uh, to be able to pull out out of uh, that uh, gracefully as a coach. Yeah, I I see a lot of new coaches, they don't wanna go there because they're they're afraid. They don't understand how to work with emotions. Um, So practice, I mean, practice, 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 right? And yes, if, um, I don't know if you mentioned, yeah, and not being able to recover, the last thing you said, not being able to recover from an emotional dive. First of all, we shouldn't be diving into the pond. <laughs> yeah, didn't we say that already? <laughs> but yeah, but there are um, highly sensitive people, beings, who maybe take on those emotions, empaths. Mm-hmm. Um, so you really need to take care of yourself. But like, if, well, what are your thoughts on this? If you're a super empath, you're a coach, like where you take on every single emotion of the other person, like what do you do to sort of protect yourself? Yeah, this could be also another whole discussion, but there's the the concept of practicing, right? Just enough detachment so that you're not getting lost in that emotional right these all this energy is coming toward you you're starting to absorb it and take it in because you're an empath but you have to figure out a way of being able to distance yourself from that so that you can kind of stay in session and be with the client without reacting yourself and being triggered um there's a visualization i i teach people it involves uh visually visualizing yourself as a rock in a raging river that's really helpful. The emotions are just the water raging and just flowing around you as a rock, but you are sitting there in the river, not moved at all, just just being there. Uh, so there's visualizations that can help. And even the concept of setting shields, that's more of an energetic technique, but mm-hmm. the, the even just visualizing a shield around you can be very helpful to let that emotion coming towards you just kind of slide off and bounce right off the shield. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's, there's a lot of different ways to do that, but those are some of the ways that you can that can be helpful for you, especially if you are an empathic coach. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks for all that. I I think we need to have an episode, <laughs> like you said, a longer discussion. Some good stuff there. I, yeah, good stuff. 
So yeah, what are some other things that might get in the way of a coach being able to sense emotions in their clients? Yeah, let's see here, rounding out the list, I'm thinking of lack of empathy, lack of emotional intelligence, uh, lack of just intuition, basically, like not listening to those messages being told to us from all sorts of other places, uh, besides our ears. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Lack of uh, compassion, right? Sensitivity training. You know, how does one even show compassion for another human being? If we weren't tr taught that as children, how did we get here to today? You know, even um, coach biases are out there too. Racial ones, gender, class, religious. What other ones that we may have as biases that we don't even know that we have? Uh, and a lot of those are uh, cultural too, based on you know, where we were born, how we were born, where, what country you came from, uh, uh, a country that is outside of yours may have different ways of viewing the world than the one we're in right now, or your client, where, the one that your client is in. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I'm smiling because I'm like, oh my God, this is a lot. And it is a lot. It's a lot to take in. It's a lot to consider, which is why we always say coaches get a coach. Episode two or three, was it? We have an one episode on that. Coaches need a coach, work on your compassion skills, work on your intuition, work on your biases, and get coached on those fears, for sure. So yeah, shall we move along? Shall we talk about how to work with emotions in a coaching session? Yes, let's talk about sessions. So what do you, uh, what do you offer to new coaches about sensing a, an emotion uh, in a session? Yeah, the first thing I would offer is about the idea of holding space. So our, our culture, and by culture, I mean not, not only here in the States, but just in general, you know, this, this fast paced action, doing, pushing, pushing culture in which we live, it, it does not allow space for emotions in general, aside from happiness, because, you know, we all want to be happy, right? <laughs> it's That's all the about only being acceptable happy. one. <laughs> That's right. Toxic <laughs> happiness. But this is something that we as coaches can offer to clients. I think it's really special. So first and foremost, like actively listen, listens actively. This is a competency in, in, in ICF and the National Board um, for Health and Wellness coaches. Listen to your client and beyond the words, listen carefully, work on those skills. And if you sense an emotion, hold that space, you might not have to say anything at all. And sometimes holding that space, that's exactly what is needed. You don't need to say anything, offer anything, just be with them, be with their emotions. And this alone can be extremely powerful and healing. Um, I also invite clients to shift their language. And um, so new coaches, listen to your clients how they how they state something if if a client offers up a feeling or emotion it's usually stated as i am sad i am angry so i like to offer to invite them to say that um this this is an experience or a feeling so i am i am experiencing sadness instead and this is a great way to start to distance oneself from the emotion, even though the chemical is in us, you know, <laughs> but to distance yourself. Many clients have felt relief just from this, this simple exercise. Um, another thing I, I do with new coaches and with clients, um, I don't have the book here, but Carla McLaren, I mentioned earlier, she has a beautiful book called Language of Emotions. Highly recommend it, highly recommend listening to it. She reads it herself and she's hilarious. I love her. Um, and our, our mentor coach does this too, is to create a visual of that emotion. So it's actually like you're seeing it in front of you. How big is it? How small is it? What color is it? What size? What shape? Um, does it have a smell? Is there a sound? So your client really gets outside of it and has a little bit of distance. Um, that sometimes helps a lot with emotions um, in sessions. And yeah, finally, I invite new coaches to really learn all they can about emotions. Um, I mentioned the Carla McLaren book. I mentioned the Candace 
Hurt book, Molecules of Emotion. Here's another one, Lisa Feldman Barrett, How Emotions Are Made. The font is really small in this book, <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's, a, it's a long read, um, but it's really good. She's a neuroscientist, it's, it's fascinating. Um, but yeah, we'll leave this info in the, in the show notes as well. But yeah, what about you? What are, what are some things you do or things you would suggest new coaches do when it comes to emotions and sessions? Yeah, great stuff, Sandy. Um, to add to that, uh, yeah, just first acknowledging the emotions so that you don't just let the client just keep talking and you, your conversation goes even past it. Um, use your intuition, generate a question. Uh, what are you feeling right now regarding that? Make an observation. I'm sensing a lot of emotion behind whatever it is. What do you think? So we want to generate that awareness, the identification and acknowledgement of the emotion and feeling in the client. Then, only then, we can then more effectively determine what is really causing it. Watch the language. You know, be careful of judgmental language uh, for an expressed emotion. You may accidentally invalidate or dismiss someone uh, due to their emotion expressed. You might be doing it even unconsciously due to bias or trigger. So practice that neutral language and response to any emotion that may be coming up. Yeah, language is so important. And you just mentioned neutral language. Could you give an example of that? Like, what do you mean by neutral language? By neutral language, I mean to generate some kind of response that minimizes possible interpretations in a way to remove things like judgment and alternative interpretations by the client. So it'd be something like, I can see you're upset, but getting angry won't solve anything. <laughs> I understand you're angry, but you're overreacting. I'm sorry, but I don't think angry is the right way to handle this situation. You're entitled to your feelings, but I think you're being unreasonable. I can tell you're really angry right now, but maybe you should take a step back and calm down before you continue. <laughs> so, I mean, these are a little bit off. <laughs> Super judging. I know, jeez. I'm feeling uh, very judged. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Sorry Talk about, about that, somatics. Sandy. I was getting, I was getting a little. I know, getting a little like, sweaty. Don't there, tell me you? what I'm feeling. Yeah, don't that tell white me. White skin, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you can see where you acknowledge the emotion, but then, ooh, there's actually a judgment sitting in there. You're making some assumptions about why that person's feeling that way and what they may even should or should not be doing because of that. But a neutral response would be something like, "I just sense a lot of anger in you." You know, it sounds <laughs> very Darth Vader like. Darth Vader. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the theme for today. You know, that's be like Coach be Vader. Like coach Vader. Yikes. I don't know if I'd want him as a coach. <laughs> There's a lot of fear, a lot of anger there. A lot of there hate. you go. <laughs> he needs some work on his compassion. Yeah, sensing, sensing is important. Um, intuition, you mentioned intuition several times. It can be really useful when it comes to emotions. That's a skill to develop for sure. But what, yeah, what else? Overall, acknowledging the emotions, working with them, it's a great opportunity for us coaches to build rapport. It re and you know, we want to reassure the client that this is a safe space, that they can express themselves in any way that they feel comfortable, so that there's no judgment. It's just our observations. Um, and it also really allows them to open up and really, and we can really start really getting into what's going on mm -hmm. inside them. Yeah, no judgment. We're not being judgy here, except for what those <laughs> you said earlier. <laughs> Ooh, but maybe, yeah, yeah, me too. But non-judgmental curiosity. I, I invite my clients to sort of adopt this as a way of noticing their own emotions, their own thoughts, their own feelings, behaviors, all that. And this can be really useful with emotions inside and outside of coaching conversations for both the client and the coach to just notice what's going on. Absolutely. Some other things that are coming up for me now uh, that could be helpful. We've talked about positive and negative, right? This is along the same lines of that. It's just simply the validity of all emotions and feelings, right? Just talking to the client about that, they can feel uh, and have any kind of emotions and they're all valid. And, uh, and welcome. And it really helps them realize that there are no good and badness about this, no positive negativity. And that can lead to judgment and, uh, and negative results from that. Um, sometimes just being with an emotion, fully experiencing it can be very helpful too. 
letting those emotions and feelings run through us. It can be really tough and uncomfortable to let that happen. But if we don't face them, then how can we deal with them if we just kind of let them stew inside us somewhere? So to just sit with the emotions and increase our comfort with them, uh, being in our consciousness can be really helpful. And uh, I've personally done some breathing exercises while they're doing that, and that can help reprogram the nervous system to not be so reactive to the presence of these particular feelings. We've talked about detaching, right? Unsticking emotions um, so we can just detach just enough to reprogram the nervous system to have a different response. Uh, because we don't want to detach fully because we don't want to inadvertently cause complete dissociation. That's like running away from the emotion again. So we, we don't want that to happen. Another simple one is the emotional wheel. Uh, some folks out there have created these wheels of uh, putting all the emotions in there. And they're great because sometimes client, you meet clients who can't express them, their, what they're feeling right now. So I ask them to pull up the emotion wheel. It's like, oh, where are you on this wheel? And so it really allows them to see a word and go, oh, that's me, right? That's what's going on inside right now. So it can really help us coaches discern what's going on underneath in clients. Yeah. Do you have a wheel that you use that you can share? And we yeah, can put it in the show Absolutely. Notes. There's a couple of wheels out there, so we can put all those in the show notes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool, cool. Yeah. And uh, another thing that's come up is uh, we've talked a little bit about somatic solutions, right? Emotions and feelings can really become resident in the body and it gets stuck there and we have to release them. So there's lots of techniques to do that and and too much to get into, but they are, they are out there and encourage coaches to go and explore those because working with emotions, feelings just in the mind may not be enough given the client. Mm -hmm. And case in point, me and my therapist, <laughs> and she was using therapeutic techniques, but coaching comes, you know, it's, it comes from therapy. So a lot of the techniques are the same, but um, yeah, going to the body can be a wonderful way in the back door of the brain, I call it. Instead Absolutely. of using using words and talking in circles. So what happens if and when a client has a strong emotion in a session? Like how how does a coach manage strong emotions from clients? I just stacked my questions. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. It's all right. Uh, first, you got to manage yourself right? Don't magnify the emotion inadvertently, right? You don't want to all of a sudden get amped up because your client's amped up. So really work on how to manage your own reaction to whatever's coming up for the client. On the other hand, don't be a robot either. Don't just sit there and like stone face and do nothing, <laughs> right? We have to train ourselves to respond appropriately uh, but also with an eye towards resolution as well, uh, because this is a coaching session. Acknowledge the feelings without judgment, as we talked about previously. Sometimes just sitting patiently. We've talked about just holding that space. Um, and that kind of goes back to managing yourself. Can you just sit there while someone is crying or angry or, you know, shouting, screaming in, in front of you, right? It's like, can you just sit there and go, Hey, everything's cool. I get you, right? I see you. Get a coach. <laughs> get a coach. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so you are able to sit there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And then coach, right? Some of the previous suggestions that we talked about might apply. Show that respect, the compassion, be gentle in your approach. Ramping energy on the coach side may magnify already strong emotions in the session. So create mm -hmm. that safe container of calm. So the client, uh, will be drawn to your centeredness and your calm atmosphere that you've created. And then we can start diffusing that energy. Right. Going back to our mentor coach, keep mentioning her. Um, she's, she's genius at this of just managing her own emotions and body language and breathing. And she'll just take a breath and something I, we had in the notes and then I, I, I edited it out, but emotional contagion, you know, we, we will take on the emotions of those around us. It's just something we do unconsciously. And so we can do that as coaches to, to invite a client to a calmer space, not to a happy, toxic place. <laughs> We're not a positivity, <laughs> happiness bully, but Sorry. just to, um, yeah, invite them into a calmer space. 
Yeah, absolutely. What so, else? Yeah. So a good goal for the coach by the end of the session is to make sure these strong feelings are managed, right? So you want to leave the client in a way that they don't feel like they're left hanging, right? Ah, oh, right. they're crying, crying all of a sudden, like, oh, I got to go. Sorry. Bye. You know, like, whoa, <laughs> you know, like, I'm still sitting here crying, right? As a client, that's not really a great place to, to leave them. This takes skills, so you know, keep working on yourself and your coaching skills, practice when you can, uh, and engage that great mentor coach to really help you here. Mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately, you know, we're humans too, so if the situation becomes too much for you as a coach, gracefully exit as best you can and explain the situation as authentically as you can, right? And just say, you know what, I'm having a moment now too. Um, could we just stop, but could we pause now? Um, and just exit as, as best you can. Mm -hmm. gracefully but being direct and honest and authentic and yeah if a, a strong emotion comes up towards the end of the session yeah don't leave a client hanging um stay out of that pool number one um but allow enough time in your sessions to you know maybe do a brief visualization some breathing i mean it's invite the client you know don't force them and again, humor. Humor is a great way to just lighten up the mood a little bit to bring them back back to the present present moment. Yeah, all that. Absolutely. So I'm curious, Sandy, what do you see in the student sessions you review when it comes to this topic of emotions? Right. Student sessions. Well, three things in a nutshell. First is is just failure to recognize an emotion. So we talked about being in our heads. Maybe a student is too much in their head. They're thinking about what the client said two minutes ago. Um, they're thinking about what question they want to ask. They're thinking about how to word their reflection. I still do this. <laughs> it, it is a challenge for me to be fully present and not be in my head. Um, maybe they're worried about their performance as a coach. Maybe there's a little bit of people pleasing tendencies going on. Maybe there's just not enough practice. So number one, failure to, to even recognize an emotion. Uh, number two, ignoring the emotions of a client. Again, fear, not knowing what to say, not knowing how to handle a client's emotions. We talked about all that. Maybe they're not aware of their own emotions that they're bringing into the space. And again, maybe they just need more practice. There's a theme here practice 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 <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah but the third thing the third thing is and we've talked about this too is is i see students trying not even trying they're pushing a client to a more positive space and we don't ever want to push as coaches or or solutions um instead of just holding that space with the client being there with the client sometimes that's enough sometimes that's enough and regarding all three of these things, this is where coaches really need to work on their own stuff. As our mentor coach says, you will not be able to take a client any further than where you have gone yourself. So think about that one. How much work have you done? <laughs> <laughs> and she also says, our clients will come with the same issues we have. So get familiar with your own issues because they, you will attract them and it happens. And it's funny, ha ha, not really, because <laughs> it does happen. So bottom line, do, do your own work. Yeah, so profound, I love that. Let's see, what else? Any other thoughts on this topic of emotions? Actually, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so in our notes in preparing for this, this recording, you had brought up some excellent points around grief and loss. And I see a lot of grief and loss in my sessions. So can we go there for a minute? Would that be okay? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I'm sensing some discomfort, Dave. <laughs> sense fear in you. I Coach sense Nader. fear. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on grief and loss? Yeah, let's see here. Yeah. Often grief and loss are maybe focused more towards the loss of a loved one, a child, a partner, a pet, something like that. But it can actually mean other things like a 
loss of a job, which you know is a big thing for a lot of people because it takes up so much time in our lives, right. or or any kind of previous life experience that they had attachments for. When our life transitions and changes, when we change our friends, all that kind of stuff, there can be a lot of resistance um, and, and reactions to that uh, because we're putting that behind us, moving into a new space. So all that mm -hmm. can be really involved with gr uh, grief and loss. Mm -hmm. A lot of my clients are experiencing some sort of chronic illness, autoimmune disease, and there is that loss of a life they once had, loss of a life they're never going to have. You think about diet, there's loss of foods they used to love and eat. Um, mm -hmm. There might be loss of support, friends, family who just don't understand chronic illness. And I mean, a lot of loss <laughs> mm -hmm. and grief comes with or follows that loss. And it's it's often not acknowledged in our culture. I've said that before, I'll say it again. Mm -hmm. um, a psychologist, Dr. Joan Rosenberg, she has something she calls disguised grief. So I'm curious to hear what you think about this. So she says disguised grief is, quote unquote, the gap between what we wanted, what we needed, what we felt we deserved, and what we really got. So to explain that further, there can be grief, disguised grief, over something we got but we didn't deserve. So if you think about abuse, verbal, emotional, emotional, physical abuse, grief over something we deserved but didn't get. If you think about praise as a child, affirmations, acknowledgement, grief over what never was, speaking from personal experience i wasn't able to have children a lot of grief there grief over what is not now not even going to go there but yes <laughs> and grief over what may never be and for me personally i will never be a mother so right there there's like you know three out of five for me and I think this shows up a lot in sessions uh, and and it might appear as anger, bitterness, blame, envy, hostility, jealousy, there might be grudges, negativity, pessimism. I mean, I can go on resentment is a big one that shows up. It might, people might think it's anger. Maybe it's grief. Maybe it's disguised grief. And I might add victimhood to that list. Mm -hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on this idea of disguised grief? Well, I love all of that that you just said. It, to me, it seems like it's about feelings and emotions then that are still unresolved, unprocessed, unacknowledged, uh, undigested even, to throw kind of a few interpretations out there. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like Coach Vader needs a, needs a lot of self-work, all those words Coach that you Vader. used there. Yeah. <laughs> Regret, oh, resentment, poor, desire for revenge. Oh Holy moly. Poor Anakin. Yeah, the world is all about Star Wars, right? It, it is. <laughs> <laughs> episode episode one, the 30 minute menace. Go see it in a theater near you. There you go. Yeah. So we're slowly wrapping up here, but what, what are some things coaches can do in sessions when it comes to, to grief and loss specifically? Some things that come to mind would be, uh, if we're talking about grief with respect to loved ones, acknowledge those feelings just without judgment, show empathy and understanding, but watch out for saying, I know how you feel. Uh, unless you really can relate, you might fall into a place where you're being unauthentic, um, and that's not probably a good thing. Uh, inquire as to what they may need right now, and if necessary, get them out of their thinking side, because they're always thinking about what can I do right now? But instead, what do their feelings say they need it? Uh, so ask, you know, get them into the feeling side. Uh, many of these actions may be internal. So adjust our language to be open to things that need to work on inside and not externally. Yeah, and that you mentioned, this is great. You mentioned to ask, what do their feelings say they need? And that exercise from Carla McLaren, where you describe the feeling, the emotion, like make it something that you can talk to and then ask it, you know, what does it need? What is the message you have for me? That can be helpful with grief. Yeah, absolutely. 
And if we're talking about something else like a loss of job or a previous life experience you're leaving behind, um, I've had instances where I just suggest to them, say, it sounds like you're grieving right now. And they go, oh, how interesting, right? Providing that concept to them is a, uh, gives them a metaphor that potentially can get them to some resolution. So then they can start th really thinking about, well, what will allow them to put the situation behind them? Yeah, and I just want to say, I Go mentioned ahead. to you before we started recording, I'm re-listening to a lot of our mentor coaches sessions from the past few years. And there is so much grief that I didn't catch the first time around, but I, I'm sensing it this time around. And it's interesting because the client usually has no idea there is grief. Like she would say, I'm sensing a lot of grief. And the client's really like, huh? what? And after a couple questions, you know, the waterworks start and it's like, well, there it is. You know? <laughs> there is so much grief, hidden grief, disguised grief, unacknowledged grief. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So just setting that different way of looking at that, right, can help them realize that there is grief here and grieving that is needed. Yeah. Um, sometimes a present uh, and future orientation is also needed. So a simple coaching question like, Given that was in your past, you know, what would you like to move towards from here? Mm -hmm. And then just shift from that sitting in the past, how miserable you feel now to move from there. I don't know what to do next. And as soon as you ask them, where do they want to go with this? All of a sudden they're like, oh, you know, if I want to get out of this, I better do something else or go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. so and this is, helpful. yeah, sorry, I'm interrupting. No, go ahead. This is also, yeah, a great distinction between coaching and therapy. Like that was then, what do you want to do now? Moving forward from that. We don't stay back there in the pond. <laughs> We're like moving forward. So that's a great distinction. I, I like that, that question. It's a good one. Yeah. And usually time and, time and space are really great topics here. Because too many people, especially in our today's society, they want to race through their grieving process and escape that pain and all the other feelings that they don't want to, that are so uncomfortable, right, for them. But oftentimes, people just need time and space. So, but without it, if they try to rush things, uh, it can really halt any attempts to try to get to, to, to try to get over something too soon for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A practice I often share with clients is to, air quotes here, hold a funeral for what is lost. It can be a job, a diet change, you know, loss of foods, community support, um, a life you thought you had. Our mentor coach <laughs> shared this with us many moons ago. I actually held a funeral for my father, who is still alive, by the way, but he is a very different person than he, I thought he was. Some secrets came out. I'm just going to leave it at that. Mm. And it changed my perception of him. There was a lot of anger, a lot of hidden grief. And I, I held a little funeral for him. Mm. So I often invite clients to do this when there is a loss or a change. And it's very helpful in moving forward for most people. And yeah, there's just, there's a lot of grief in this world. And so much of it is not apparent when you are just looking at the surface. We're not taught how to hold space for grief or any uncomfortable emotion for that matter. We're not taught how to process it, how to sit with it instead of pushing it down, pushing it away. As mentioned above, emotions are chemicals in our body. So they're a part of us. And when we ignore these chemicals, we are, in essence, ignoring a part of ourselves. So we're not being a whole person. And in my coaching practice, I coach very holistically. So I look at the whole person. And emotions are a part of us. So yes, I coach around emotions. They are not just for therapy. All of this to say, if you, the listener, the viewer, if, if you are uncomfortable with your own grief or other emotions, you most likely will be uncomfortable in your sessions if this comes up with a client. So again, find a coach, find a therapist, find a spiritual advisor, find all three. Like 
get the support you need to do your own emotional work so you can hold that space for your clients' emotions. It is so true, right? That coaches, we are always working on ourselves. And, and to be honest, if you want to be a better coach and be able to handle more types of clients and even get better at your craft, work on yourself first, because that's one of the best things you could do for your business, for your coaching uh, skills. Mm -hmm. Anything else before we close for today? Nope. I am good. I am wiped out. Let's talk of emotions. <laughs> I need a nap or a good cry. I haven't decided yet. <laughs> moon in oh, cancer. Everything is valid for you. <laughs> the moon is in cancer. For those astrology fans, those water signs can be emotional. I'm mm. also wearing blue just because of the yeah, topic. Hey. But uh, yeah, it's a good good day to talk about emotions. What else? Resources. We'll leave some in the show notes. Where can people find you, Dave? CoachDeshen.com. And where can people find you, Sandy? SwansonCoaching.com. That's it for now. We'll see you next time, everyone. Bye. Bye, Dave. Until good to see you. Time. Good to see you. Bye-bye.